Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be going over chapter 27 of the American pageant titled Empire and Expansion from 1890 to 1909. As always, we're going to be using the 16th edition of the American pageant. If you have an earlier or a later edition or a completely different textbook, don't worry about it. The content's going to be the same. So to start off, this video and the next couple videos are going to be a little different. Um, I'm not going to be putting in the key concepts any longer because the key concepts are, you know, just I copy and paste them from the textbook and I think it's copyrighted material and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do that. So just to be on the safe side, I'm not going to be putting the key concepts on these videos, but you can always refer to your textbook. The key concepts are at the beginning of every chapter, at least in the American pageant. So if you need to look at those, um, you can find them there. And I definitely recommend that you do because it'll really help you organize the information and it will be super helpful for when you're preparing for the AP exam because you'll already have compartmentalized the information into the various subtopics and topics that you need to. It'll be easier to remember the information. So if you can, I would definitely recommend matching the key concepts to the key terms because it will really help with all of that. So to start off, let's talk about imperialism. This is going to be a major um, American foreign policy during this time. So it's definitely important that you know about it and specifically, what are the motives behind it? Why do people want to expand um, outward, outside of the US? And this all really begins when Frederick Jackson Turner, who was a historian at the time, declared the frontier, which was a defining part of American culture, had completely vanished by 1890. So America can't expand westward anymore because there is nowhere else to expand. The frontier was that little boundary, that imaginary boundary between, um, you know, where the US had developed and sort of built their population versus places where they haven't really explored yet and that mostly the natives had settled in. So now that they had basically conquered most of um, the area, they had to move outwards. That's what they felt. So they would now turn to acquiring territories abroad. And there were many reasons for why some people wanted to expand. For example, um, economic reasons. Farmers and factory owners alike both wanted new markets to sell to because this would really help alleviate the concerns with the sometimes violent labor movement and the general agrarian unrest because they would have a larger market to sell to. The domestic market had basically, you know, it had been filled up. Everyone had everything they needed, so people, or farmers and factory owners specifically, weren't able to maximize their profits as much as they usually would be. So if they were able to sell abroad and have a market, a guaranteed market, they would be able to have even more profits and the appeal of that, especially to farmers who are in a massive amount of debt with all the machinery they um, bought, it was very appealing to them. And there were also religious reasons to this because, you know, for example, Reverend Josiah Strong, he was a known white supremacist and he saw expansion overseas as an opportunity to spread Christianity through missionaries because he thought that they needed to civilize non-Anglo-Saxon people. And some even used the idea of Darwinism to suggest that the, quote, strongest people were allowed, even obligated, to control the world. So ultimately, the U.S. is, you know, happy to explore all of these wonderful possibilities, wonderful things that they'll find in foreign lands and being able to sell to new markets, and maximize profitability. But underlying all of this is the sentiment that like they're entitled to it, that they're entitled to expand, that they're doing this huge service to people. Obviously they're not, but they think they are and they think they're amazing for doing all of this. So with imperialism, we're going to see this sort of uh, stubbornness, almost like this entitledness that like we are the best and we deserve to teach these quote uncivilized people about how to be civilized so it's going to be you know to some extent very racist obviously it's not only racism there's also economic factors at play but it can't be ignored another reason you should know about is political reasons because remember america wants to compete with other nations they think they are the best nation and they they almost think they're invincible, so they want to prove themselves to everyone else. And this is really seen with Captain Alfred T. Mahan's The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. And essentially in this um, letter or book article, I don't really know what it was, but this captain argued that gaining control over the sea, aka naval dominance, was the key to attaining world dominance. So think back to colonial times, right? Britain, um, after they defeated the Spanish and the Spanish Armada, they became the world's greatest um you know world power they controlled the colonies they controlled colonies outside of like the 13 colonies they were a really strong uh power so people still believe that to some extent and they believe that it was important to 
um, you know, control the sea and just in general show that you are invincible. And so for all of these reasons, America decides to implement this foreign policy that becomes known as the Big Sister Policy. This was pursued throughout the 1880s and it was aimed at gaining support from Latin American countries in order to open up Latin American markets for Northern traders. So in other words, if, you know, they, if the US showed that they were good, and that they had good intentions, maybe Latin American countries would be more open to accepting um, their, their sales and just in general be more open to buying from, from them. This made some progress because it did lead to a Pan-American conference in 1889, and there were sort of semblances of inter-American, meaning you know between North America, Central America, South America, they were all to some extent a little bit more unified because of all of this, but definitely not like completely best friends alliances, like just a little bit closer together. So it definitely did alleviate some tensions. You should also know about the Great Reproachment. This happened um, after decades of on and off tensions between the US and Britain. And this foreign policy allowed American diplomats to restore more cordial relationships with Britain. So again, America is trying to restore relationships with uh, foreign countries to be a bit more amicable and they don't really want any problems. And this alliance will be really, really important during World War I, so aside from imperialism, it is definitely going to help them um, in the near future. Okay, moving on, let's talk about Hawaii. Hawaii is really where we're going to see the first uh, sort of implementation of American imperialism, so it's really important that you know about it and the motivations behind why America wants to imperialize Hawaii. And so the key reasons why America wants to sort of conquer Hawaii is because, first of all, it was a key center for sugar production, and sugar is or was a cash crop, so it was very profitable, and that was definitely a huge incentive. And second of all, Christian missionaries could be sent to convert the people there. So again, although there is an economic factor to imperialism, they want to make more money, maximize profits, there definitely is a racist, almost white supremacist type of uh, sentiment underlying it. So definitely keep that in mind. And especially after the purchase of Pearl Harbor, the US began to view like all of the islands as their own. They thought they were entitled to all of the islands because they owned this harbor so um yeah they were definitely feeling very entitled to it there were debates of you know should we annex it or whatnot but this debate was very controversial and it was really intensified by two very important events one was the mckinley tariff of 1890 which made sugar imports a lot less profitable and second was the increased asian laborers who were sent to work on these sugar plantations in hawaii so this heightened fears that a foreign government some asian foreign government could intervene in hawaii to protect their workers or just in general maybe take over the island something like that and possibly annex it so this is all sort of stirring the U.S. to think, okay, maybe we should annex them. And this leads us to Queen Lilio Kalani. She was obviously the ruler of Hawaii, and she believed that Hawaii should be ruled by the people, not some foreign nations who knew nothing about the islands. And so this leads to a small insurrection by white plantation owners in Hawaii, which leads to the queen being dethroned and a rushed annexation proposal to Congress. The U.S. is hoping, or at least plantation owners and some people in the U.S. are hoping that the government will take advantage of this vulnerability and hopefully annex Hawaii. However, the then president, President Cleveland, believed that it was wrong to annex Hawaii in this way and argued that most of Hawaiians wouldn't really support annexation, which is obvious because who would want a foreign nation interfering in their own um, domestic affairs? That just seems messed up. It would be like a dictatorship. No one would want that. So he understands that people would be upset by that and he ultimately decides to block the annexation plan, but obviously Hawaii will eventually be taken in 1898, which we'll talk about later. So this is a very important moment. He's actually being somewhat considerate considering all of the other stuff that's happening. He's saying, this isn't the right time. Yes, I agree we should annex it because he is, you know, in some to some extent, he still believes that the US is entitled to that land, even though they're not. But he says, this is not the right time. It won't be successful. Meanwhile, while all of this is happening in Hawaii, Cuban insurrectos or, you know, uh, rebel leaders revolted against the Spanish authorities because obviously Spanish the Spanish controlled Cuba and this was partially because their sugar economy was crippling under Spanish rule. The rebels pursued a scorched earth policy burning sugar fields and sugar plantations and now the American plantation owners who were owning those sugar plantations are going to be upset 
because they're they're losing a lot of money it's all about profits for them so they are now going to get involved with that and so that leads us to cuba that's the next place where the u.s is really going to practice their imperialism to a much larger extent compared to hawaii and this is again definitely one you should know about but keep in mind that the u.s is not interfering in cuban affairs simply for imperialist reasons they might they definitely will with other countries but in regards to cuba they do have some genuine concern in regards to what's happening there and really there are two main reasons for this one is yellow journalism which is basically exaggerated journalism um to produce or elicit a response in the audience and it exaggerated the brutal treatment of the cubans by the spanish although they were definitely brutally treated by the spanish um by the spanish officials like for example general quote butcher weiler that was like his nickname he was called the butcher because he killed so many people although they were definitely tormented the yellow journalists definitely um exaggerated it a bit and the second reason is that the u.s knew that whoever controlled cuba controlled the gulf of mexico so they are again interested in these trade possibilities However, the U.S. finally gets involved with the publication of the DeLome letter. This was the secret letter that was published when a Spanish minister essentially calls President McKinley, the now president after Cleveland has left office, he's calling President McKinley a coward. He's saying they're not going to do anything. We can torment um, the Cubans all we want. They don't have the guts. They don't have the power to do that. So now the U.S. is kind of like their ego is sort of touched. They're like, OK, no, we, we are invincible. We are the best and we will prove it to you. So they're officially going to get involved after this. In fact, the U.S. acts immediately following the Maine explosion in 1898. So there was this U.S. ship called the Maine, and it was sent to Cuba to save Americans who were still stuck on the island. However, the ship eventually explodes really suddenly. Obviously, no one expected it, and it killed hundreds of people on board. So most Americans are convinced that the Spanish did this intentionally, despite how unlikely this was, both you know in terms of motivation and also like how would they do it. And it was really just based on unfounded claims that the Spanish did it. So they used that to pressure McKinley to go into war. And this is exactly what happened with uh, the Mexican-American War, if you remember, from like the mid-1800s. The U.S. is trying to, you know, go to a new land and start a conflict for almost mostly because of economic motives. I mean, sure, you know, there's this like underlying thing of, oh, Cuba's suffering under Spanish rule. And that was definitely a concern. But... Their real motive is economic. They want to go to Cuba and take advantage of all of the things they have there. And this is really, you know, correlating to the Mexican-American War because if you remember, the U.S. got into a dicey conflict with Mexico after they refused to sell California to them for like 25 million. And that became a whole war. And it was all based on economic profit. And you're going to see that this is sort of like a theme with American history. And so with that, McKinley decides to go to war for Cuba, and they passed the Teller Amendment in 1898. This is a joint resolution that was passed by Congress saying that the U.S. would help Cuba gain independence from Spain and then withdraw their troops immediately afterwards. But really, the U.S. is trying to disguise their imperialist and economic interest in Cuba as selfless aid for the country. So they're like, oh, we're, we're just going to help you. We're going to put our troops in, defeat the Spanish, and go right out. Obviously, that's not going to happen because they have you know different motives in that country and they aren't going to spend all that money on an island that they wouldn't care about so they obviously have ulterior motives so a group of troops were organized uh they were known as the rough riders who were organized by theodore roosevelt and the american volunteers managed to force a spanish fleet to retreat at santiago harbor which allowed for the swift takeover of cuba and so once the U.S. gains control over Cuba, they pass the Platt Amendment in 1901. And this is really just a direct contradiction of what the Teller Amendment was all about. Because although the U.S. had initially granted the U.S. some freedom, they later forced them to write this amendment into their constitution. So it said a lot of things. One, the U.S. could intervene to restore peace whenever they felt necessary. This is intentionally vague wording because the U.S. can essentially intervene whenever they want. Um, if they think that they need to restore peace, they can, but obviously they're going to intervene whenever they want for their own ulterior motives. They also said that Cuba couldn't sign a treaty with a foreign power, and it gave the U.S. Guantanamo Bay. So the U.S. is essentially manipulating Cuba 
by helping them gain like quote unquote independence. This was not really independence. They were just trying to get the Spanish out of the way so that they could take advantage of all of the economic benefits that Cuba offered. Some other places you should know about are the Philippines and Puerto Rico. They are also going to be heavily impacted by um, US imperialism as we'll talk about in a bit, but these two are definitely ones you should know about. So um, let's first talk about how the US got them. So in terms of Puerto Rico, it was ceded to the US by Spain following the US victory in Cuba as a payment for war debts, and they also got Guam, which wasn't really significant because it just it wasn't that significant at the time. However, the Philippines is not as easy as Puerto Rico and Guam were, because McKinley didn't want to leave them with the Spanish, but he also didn't want to leave them in an unorganized state, which may end up in anarchy that would allow other powers to take it over. So he has to decide whether or not he wants to buy the Philippines, um, and whether he's going to go through all of the costs of protecting it and making sure other foreign powers don't invade, and um, that's a very heavy cost for them. But eventually, McKinley decides to pay Spain for the Philippines because he wants to, quote, civilize the people. And remember, the Philippines already have a developed and diverse culture that has lasted centuries. There is no need for civilizing, that's just racism. But obviously, the U.S. will try to assimilate the Philippines to, you know, their uh, customs, and this will lead to resistance, which will lead to um, brutal guerrilla wars between the two, because they had expected to gain complete independence following the war. The the Philippines were promised complete independence, and when they didn't get that, and actually got another form of oppression, they are obviously going to rebel against it. However, not everyone was on board with this whole imperialism thing. In fact, you have the Anti-Imperialist League, um, which protested McKinley's imperialization and said that it dishonored America's commitment to anti-colonialism. Essentially, they were saying that it went against the con Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, everything that the country was built upon, the idea that you can rule for yourself. And it gradually declined in strength once the U.S. annexed the Philippines and after they had to use military force to control them. Meanwhile, in Puerto Rico, you have the Forker Act in 1900. This established a limited popular government in Puerto Rico, and it was the first attempt at establishing an authority there, um, and in general, in the newly acquired territories from the Spanish-American War. So the U.S. can control this new land to a great enough degree while also giving the people representation in government. And eventually, a similar model will be established in the Philippines in 1902, but um, at this point, they're still fighting them in a guerrilla war, so that's not happening. But essentially, they're trying to give Puerto Rico enough wiggle room that they can, you know, be represented in government and not rebel because they're already, because the U.S. is already dealing with the Philippines and they don't need more of that. So they realize, okay, we have to give them, like, some rights and some feeling that they're in at least a little bit of control, which is why they grant them a very limited amount of popular representation. And in terms of... Uh, you know, things that affected all of the newly acquired territories, you should definitely know about the insular cases. So these were Supreme Court cases that started over questions as to whether the new territories would have the same rights under the Constitution as other American citizens. The Supreme Court is really divided on this, and ultimately they say that they don't get rights, but they are subjected to American rules. So this is literally the worst of both worlds. You, you have to follow the rules, but you don't get rights within those rules. So it's, uh, it definitely sucks for them. And finally, let's talk about foreign policy, and really more specifically the aftermath of the Spanish-American War. So you should note that ultimately the Spanish-American War improved the reputation of America among European countries and further united the North and the South through nationalism. So remember, the Civil War technically wasn't all that long ago um, at this point. So the North and the South are still pretty divided and the effects of it are still lingering even now. And this sort of nationalism with the war really helped to sort of bring them together. Obviously not as close as they should be, but a little bit closer. You should also note that gaining territories proved to be a double-edged sword because gaining them meant you got more prestige and a, a bigger reputation as we saw, you know, European countries began to respect America a little bit more. But it also meant that the U.S. wasn't able to protect all areas efficiently, and we'll definitely talk more about this later, but um, really the U.S. is sort of spreading itself thin at this point, and it's trying to just make sure they don't lose anything. Aside from the Spanish-American War, you should know about the Open Door Note. Um, this was essentially created because American traders feared that Europeans would try to monopolize on Chinese markets. So a trade agreement was set up so that everyone was allowed to trade freely with China. And this really caused tensions with China because no one really, you know, 
sanctioned this. Um, China didn't sanction it, at least. They, the European countries and the US sort of just did it. And so tensions in China towards foreigners grew, as we'll see in a little bit. And um, yet it still remained a US foreign policy in Asia for many decades. And you really see those rising tensions with the Boxer Rebellion in 1899. Um, rebels who protested foreign influence in China began murdering foreigners and Chinese Christians for assimilating slash accepting the intrusive missionaries. And ultimately the rebellion was suppressed by troops, but it just does show that foreign policy did have an impact domestically in China. In terms of what's happening domestically in the US, McKinley is re-elected president in 1900, but he's murdered soon after and his uh, vice president Theodore Roosevelt takes over. So Roosevelt is very well known for using big stick diplomacy, which we'll talk about later, but essentially it's completely, you know, anti-pacifism and only using force when necessary. So the US isn't going to start anything unless there's anything worth starting, but they're also not going to sit back and take whatever whatever other countries do to them. So if someone um, starts a conflict, they're going to respond and they aren't going to sit idly watching by. And Roosevelt has other aspirations. For example, he wants to build the Panama Canal, which was allowed in the hay Ponce Fort Treaty, and um, Colombian-controlled Panama doesn't allow it, they refuse. So Roosevelt funds the Panamanian rebels because that was a thing happening there, and they eventually overthrow the Colombian government and allow the US to build the canal. You should also know about the Roosevelt Corollary in 1904. This was passed under Roosevelt, again, obviously, Roosevelt Corollary, and it said that the US would pay off any debts that Latin America incurred in order to keep European powers out of the area. So this is really a justification for US intervention in Latin countries, and they could really get as involved as they wanted to under the excuse that they're concerned for the well-being of that country. It is exactly like the, the Platt Amendment. You know, the US was telling Cuba, oh, we are just going to um, involve ourselves for your own good. We're going to help you. The same thing applies here. They just want European powers to back off from that entire area so that, you know, hopefully maybe they can get something out of it um, without too much of a struggle. And that's clearly evident with this corollary. Okay, we have a couple more things to go over um, with this chapter. It's really just a few things I didn't have space for on the last slide. So um, first you should know that Japan goes to war with Russia and Roosevelt manages to create a compromise treaty between the two. Japan is upset because they aren't compensated for their losses, which leads to rising tensions with the US. This is eventually resolved sort of in the Root Takahira Agreement of 1908. This was signed between the US and Japan and said that both countries would respect spheres of influence that the other country had and respect general international policies. So this avoided another potential war because the US had just gotten out of the Spanish-American War, they were still struggling with their territories, they did not need this right now. So, um, you know, Roosevelt just nipped it in the bud. However, tensions were still kind of high because Japanese workers are flooding to California, becoming the targets of racist, hostile whites, and San Francisco had segregated schools to make more room for white students, so Japan is infuriated. So to resolve this conflict, they have the Gentlemen's Agreement, where Roosevelt forces California to repeal the segregation laws, and Japan agrees to limit um, Japanese immigration to the U.S. So yeah, that does it for this chapter. Here are the credits for where we got everything you just saw. Thank you so much for watching. Comment below if you have any questions. Please be sure to like, subscribe, all of that. You know the drill. And um, yeah, see you in the next chapter.